This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at fbhp.com. With Coach Dave McGinnis and Rhett Bryant, I am Mike Keith at the 2024 NFL Scouting Combine. Thrilled to be joined by Daniel Jeremiah from NFL Network. Welcome. How many have you come to now, Mike? I have no idea. That's a good answer. Coach Mack has been to all of them. You've been to every single one, Coach? Every one. Holy moly. Yeah. How many is that? Well, since what to start here in 87? Yeah. What's this, 2024? It's a lot of math for somebody who went to App State. 38. <laughs> 38. <laughs> See? Mike Keith, Mike Keith is a numbers guy. Yeah. 38. Yeah. All right. That's incredible. Daniel Jeremiah in your latest mock, and you love mock drafts. My I favorite. Know. Love them. You, yeah. he, <laughs> Especially before free agency. That's, that's the good stuff. <laughs> well, and that's what I'm going to ask you about. Yeah. That's my first question. Because I'm going to play that game. You have the Titans taking Olaf Fashanu, yep. talented offensive tackle, potentially left tackle from Penn State. That's where you have them at number seven right now. If free agency puts them in a situation where the Titans do not feel that they need to take an offensive tackle at number seven, who would you put in the mock? For the Tennessee Titans, oh man, knowing I, what you know, I, having seen them last year, I would love, I would love, love, love for one of the three wideouts to be there to throw one of those three wideouts into the mix. I don't think, I think they're going to be gone. So if I take the wideouts out of the mix, gosh, and let's hit those real quick. Yeah, and you, and you're talking about Marvin Harrison Jr. Correct. You're talking about Malik Neighbors from LSU. Correct. And, and then Roma Dunze. Dunze from Washington. Mm -hmm. So you think all three of those players will be gone in the first six picks? I, I, I think we could go three quarterbacks, three receivers uh, is how the draft could start. I will say it, I'm, Adunze is my favorite player in the whole draft. So over Harrison. He's, I have Harrison one spot over Adunze on my list. I don't need that smoke. Uh, I don't need that fight. <laughs> I'm not trying to create that fight. I love Harrison. I gave him the same grade. But he's my favorite player in terms of who I watched and just I enjoyed watching this kid play and compete. The fact that he can play any of the spots, the fact that in terms of combat catches, he is better than Harrison at that, and the numbers will spell it out. Like He'll go up and get it in crowds. Um, he's got polish to him. He's, you know, one of the little things, it sounds, it sounds silly, but I still – I pay attention to this stuff how were you on this coach but when I see a wide receiver who's got a chance to go make millions of dollars in the NFL and he catches the ball near the sideline and he turns his shoulders up the field and go, goes and gets five more yards and doesn't just step out of bounds you know the that's first what that kid does well the first thing that I do when I'm doing film and I see that all I do is put a check and say ball player yep 100 percent he's playing ball mm -hmm. that's how he, that's how he is and uh everything I get really on uh I haven't got the background as much on neighbors as I have on the other two, but with Marvin Harrison Jr. and with Adunze, like the work ethic stuff's off the charts. The intelligence is off the charts. The one quick Marvin Harrison story, I can tell you this. No, I mean, it's worthless because you're never going to see him uh, unless you play against him. But and we they, will. They, they, had their, uh, they had their bowl game. They were in the playoffs a year before. So they're at the hotel, and I'm talking to one of the guys at Ohio State, and I said, hey, you know, tell me about the receiver. And uh, so we start – and I was asking about somebody else, but then he started talking about Marvin Harrison. I was talking, Smith and Jigba, who I was asking about. Yeah, sure. And then he starts telling me about Marvin Harrison, and I'm like, nah, that, I'm asking about the other guy, but go ahead, finish your story. He goes, yeah, he had us install a jugs machine on the roof of the hotel so that he could go upstairs and get 200 extra balls every night when they were preparing the week of the, of the playoff game that they had against Georgia. That, like, that, that's real stuff. I'm like, holy moly. Yeah, like this is all ball. So that – Anyways, those two receivers are unbelievable, and Neighbors is as dynamic and explosive as you're going to get. So you don't know what the Titans would do. I think, look, I, pro <laughs> I probably would say I'm going to probably lean. You get corner edge rusher, I probably would lean towards edge rusher. I'd say Dallas Turner maybe in that mix. From Alabama? Yeah. You could see him going number seven. That wouldn't shock me, no. Okay. Daniel, is that one of the main reasons why? Because I always look forward to your top 50 when it yeah. drops. And we saw the first one we were in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. Your 2.0 version has dropped this week. You now have 11 receivers in your top 50. Is that one of the reasons why? It's because there's going to be an early run on some of those guys? It's just a 
boatload of them. I mean, yeah. it's been that way the last few years, I and mean, I don't know that it's ever going to change. We're just going to continue to get wideouts every single year. Every high school, seven on seven, every yep. college is running spread four wide. I mean, it's just that's what the game has given us. And so we're getting more skilled receivers each and every year. And, you know, last year was a unique year with the tight ends. It was the best tight end draft I, I've ever been a part of. And all those guys, darn near all of them, played well and, 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 and did things. You're going to have these anomaly years where you get certain positions. Wide receivers are going to be good every single year, and this is just the next one. As a follow-up, I want to go to the tackles for a second because you've got Joe Alt listed, uh, I think, ahead of this guy. But Tally Fuaga, the tackle from yeah. Oregon uh, State, uh, from uh, it's just – He's your second guy. You've been high on this guy yeah. for a while. What is it about Tally Fuaga that that, that kind of shows up for you on film? Yeah, I've just got this weird thing. I like big, strong, tough, physical guys who don't get beat. Um, mm. So I, you know, yeah. it's just, maybe it's just me on that one, Coach. I don't know. Maybe I'm on an island on that one. But <laughs> no, uh, no, do you say those three traits again? <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. that's yeah, right. that's that's just who he is. He doesn't. I mean, I just still waiting for the game where he gives up something. He doesn't give up anything. Now he's playing on the right side. That's fine. Playing at right tackle. He's a just plug and play, ready to go. Now, it's, when you watch him, I never had any concerns about his length when I watched him. Normally, you see a guy that has shorter arms; it shows up. He doesn't have 34-inch arms. I mean, they're not. He's think he's like maybe he's uh, right at 33 or just under 33. But it's not. You know, you'd want a little bit longer player. But I never saw it as an issue when I watch him. He's got meat hooks for hands. So, and once he gets hands on you, it's over. I, I, I just, I like the way they play up there too. That coach's a good coach. He's went to Michigan State. He did. Right? Yeah, yep. Jonathan Smith. He is a good football coach. Yes, sir. That's not. I've been up. You've been up in Corvallis. You know that is not an easy place to go win. And he did a nice job up there. And they built a real toughness in that culture. And that kid was a poster child for it. So if the Titans get to seven and want to tackle, knowing their situation, that that person would be playing next to Peter Skaronsky, which one does Daniel Jeremiah pick for the Titans? Well. Yeah, I would still take Alt first. You know, I, Alt to me is just parking it in a fairway. Like, I just don't see how you really miss on that one. Now, you can say, you know, chasing upside is, I mean, he's not Laramie Tunsil. He's not, you know, one of these elite, elite movers like that. But he's so dang big and he's so long and he's, he's technically sound. Like, he just doesn't get beat. He's, I mean, he's a lot better than McGlinchey. And McGlinchey's hung on in this league for a, for a long time, but just coming out of that same school. Um, so, to me, I think he's the safe one. I just take him. Well, I mean, to, to me, and, and, and I've heard him compared to, and then talking with people around here, that he might be the Peter Skaronsky of tackles. Interesting. You know, because, you know, Peter Skaronsky was a really, and he is a really solid technique dude. Yeah. That, to me, is all. Right? Yeah, yeah I mean, 100%. That, that's it. Then you start separating those guys down. Let's, to the tackles, just for a minute, I, I think, and you tell me this, Daniel, and all the years that I've been doing this, Left tackle and right tackle now, they're forming more towards the same oh, yeah. dudes because people are putting those rushers over there on the right side on the right side of the offense now. It used to be the way it was. I mean, your closed side, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, that was where you, you do But the open side was the left side. Now that's not the same thing. So I think we're seeing those kind of morph together. Do you agree with that? I 100%. It used to be. I mean, we used to have a, a different stack on the draft board. Exactly. Which was like we had Orlando Brown at right tackle and we had Jonathan Ogden at left, left tackle. tackle. So it was like you had, you know, those are the, the different types of guys. And we're like, okay, we need a rugged run blocking right tackle and we can help him with a tight end or a back if we need to in pass protection. Those days are over. When you see Khalil Mack and T.J. Watt and all these guys coming off that side, you better have somebody they can protect over there. Well, and defenses now are moving people around so much more than they used to because the game is spread out. Yep. Anyway, I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, no, it's no, there's no difference. You better have two good ones. And speaking of offensive linemen, Daniel, is there a chance that we see interior, and I mean centers, yeah. go in night one? Because Jackson Powers Johnson, I noticed he jumped six spots up yep. from Oregon. We saw him at Senior Bowl. He was Impressive. awesome. Yeah. Yes. Zach Frazier, who's got an incredible wrestling background, had an injury at the last play of his yeah. season there from West Virginia. But there's a chance there's a run on centers in the bottom of this draft, Which right? Which sounds weird, right? It's a run on centers. But, you know, <laughs> normally normally the uh, normally the top of the second round is like your interior <laughs> offensive line. That's the portion where we see those guys all go. I just think in this draft there's there's a need around the league, and I think those three guys kind of separate themselves from, from everybody else. So – I don't know. I, Ozzie used to always say, Ozzie Newsom used to always say, in the first round, we just want doubles. We don't want to strike out. 
So I let other people chase home runs. We're going to hit doubles. And some of those doubles ended up being Ed Reed and Ray Lewis and Todd Heap and all those guys who at the time were not thought of these like high, high, you know, ceiling guys, maybe, you know, maybe not fast enough, not big enough. And he's like, these are football players. These are dead, dead middle players that you're not going to miss on. And I think those centers are in that category for me where, look, if I, if I put it on my draft resume, I just drafted a starting center for the next 10 years. Like, that's a good – that's a heck of a first-round pick, especially when you're talking about towards the back of the first round. How big a run in the first round on quarterbacks could we see? I think there's a chance that we see four and ten, you know, which is unusual to see that many. But I definitely think that's in play. You know, free agency is going to tell us, you know, where do these quarterbacks go? Are these quarterbacks going to go to the teams in the back or are they going to go to the teams in the front? Like, if the Atlanta Falcons get a quarterback, then, then we're not going to see – more than likely we won't see four quarterbacks go in the top ten. Um, but if Atlanta punts on on Kirk Cousins or some you know trading for Justin Fields, and then that needs staring them right in the face, then I think we're looking at four going in the top ten. Who makes sense to trade for Justin Fields? I've said New England. You know, to me, I think he makes sense there. Defensive head coach, usually a coach, you know this. He wants to play great defense. He wants to. They already have a really good defense. We're going to run the football, run the ball. and we're going to have an athletic quarterback who can make four or five plays a game. They have a formula that's in place there that could work with Justin Fields. And you add on top of that, now you can auction off the third pick and get a boatload of picks because uh, I think you could get Fields for the 34th pick. So now you can then trade back off of three for, you know, if it's the Giants, the Falcons, whoever wants to come up and take the third quarterback – and now I've got Justin Fields, I've got a good defense, and now I've got a bunch of picks where I can fill in the rest of the needs I have. Can we jump to defense? Real quick. Real quick. Separate, let's separate these yeah. corners pretty quick because yeah. I, th- I think this is a good corner. Yeah, it's a good too. group. Good, good group. Separate Cooper, DeGene, Terry and Arnold, and Nate Wiggins. Yeah, to me, I would go Terry and Arnold first. Yeah. To me, he's the most complete. He's got the, the fluidity and the ball skills and production, toughness, all that stuff. Hadn't played the position that long either. He was a safety. He was a, got a basketball scholarship to go to Alabama. Like, this kid's a freaky athlete. So he would be number one for me. Uh, in that group, I probably would have Wiggins, too. Wiggins is as physically gifted as anybody. He's going to be tall, long, fast, fluid. Coach, he hung on blocks too much for me. That bothered me a little bit. I just want to see a little more feistiness from him in that in that sense. I was told it happened. It got better later in the year, which I hadn't had a chance to see the late tape on him. And then Cooper DeGene is a five-position guy. Like he can play anywhere in the right. back end. So, to me, it's it's you know kind of what you're looking for a little bit with that, to, except for Arnold. Arnold would be co- clearly, for me, in my opinion, he's the top guy. There you go. Daniel Jeremiah, NFL Network. Love seeing you here at the combat. Love seeing you anyway, and looking forward to seeing you in Los Angeles this fall when the Titans come calling on the charge. How about that? SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can fan. Rhett Bryan, well done. Coach Dave McGinnis remains with us. And we are pleased to be joined by ESPN draft analyst Jordan Reed. Welcome to the 2024 NFL Combine and the OTP. Glad you're here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I can't believe it's been 365 days since I've seen you guys. Time flies, right? right? It, It certainly does. All right. We had Daniel Jeremiah on before the break, and we were talking about corners. His top corner is Terry and Arnold from Alabama. Yeah. Do you agree? I do. I, I think Tyrion is a very, very good player. Um, he's actually somebody that came to Alabama as a safety, and then he transitioned to corner his last year at Alabama. Very, very fluid hips, really good ball skills, had five interceptions last year. But everybody you talk to at Alabama who just been around Tyrion is just the smarts that he plays the game with. And it makes sense just because he's seen the game from the back end as a safety. He spent time as a nickel, and then also he spent time on the outside too. So – very smart player, very athletic. I think he's going to be a big-time tester inside Lucas Oil Stadium this week, too. Jordan, let's let's talk about a guy that we saw a few weeks ago at the Senior Bowl in Mobile that is rocketing up the charts in Toledo cornerback Quinion Mitchell. He's really He has a chance to really make uh, some more money for himself this week, literally. Yeah, he, he does. I think he was the best player 
in Mobile. And that's something that you always want to see from those group of five players. How do they adjust to the Alabamas, to the Georgias, to those SEC and ACC, Big Ten, Big 12 schools? And if, you would have, if he was to put on an Alabama helmet, you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. That's how good he was at the Senior Bowl. And what you love to see from those type of players is that you want them to build momentum throughout the year. He was very good against Illinois. And those outside of those group of five players, how do they play in what I call those up games when they're playing against that upper level type of competition? He passed that test in Illinois, but as the draft process goes along, he just continues to check boxes. And it would surprise me if he ends up running a 4-3, which would help his stock tremendously. But uh, let's talk about some more corners here. Just let's just let's go rapid fire on okay. these guys. Kamari Lassiter from Georgia. Uh, I'm a big fan. Probably the best tackling corner of any cornerback in this draft class. The 40 time is going to be crucial for him, yeah. though. Scouts want to see just how fast he is. T.J. Tampa from Iowa State. Big corner. Um, six foot two, about 200 pounds. Really good hips. He's more so of a zone corner. Um, I think that's the scheme that he fits best. Kalen King from Penn State. So he, he's one that's been a little bit disappointing during the pre-draft process. Um, one of the players that took advantage of the underclassman rule with him playing in the Senior Bowl, and I understand why he ended up playing in it, um, but I thought he was a little disappointing at the Senior Bowl, but he has an opportunity to redeem himself at the combine. Good stuff right there. Of everybody we've discussed at a corner, if the Titans choose to go corner in the second round at number 38, who do you think is the best of those players, or maybe another, that could be available? Yeah, we just talked about one. I thought T.J. Tampa definitely could be an option. I, I think he fits their scheme really, really well. Um, Ennis Rakestraw Jr. is one that I think they're going to like quite a bit. Now, I don't know if he's going to be available at 38, but as far as their scheme and what Rand Carthon has looked for uh, for defensive backs in the past, I definitely think he's another that could check some boxes. All right, got to ask about Kool-Aid McKinstry. Yeah. All right. So when all of the stuff was out in the fall from various people, talk about he may be the first corner yeah. in the draft taken. Now, most people have him in the second round. Yeah. What's happened to the Alabama product? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing has happened. Um, I think his tape is really good, but what has happened is – Tyrion Arnold is now the beauty in the beauty pageant now. Ah. So Kool-Aid is now being overshadowed by Tyrion Arnold. So nothing has really changed about Kool-Aid. I thought the tape was really good. But now this player opposite of him is getting so much love now to where um, Kool-Aid is kind of like that forgotten child in the corner now that's still very good. So I think Kool-Aid is still very good. I still have a first-round grade on Kool-Aid. So if he does end up going in the second round, it would definitely be a surprise to me, but back into the first round, I definitely think that's where he ends up going. Could he be a Roger McCrary type pick? Yeah. For the Titans, Roger McCrary's turned out to be a very good player yes. at the corner position that they got in round two. Maybe the same kind of value. Yeah, I think so. I think a dream scenario for the Titans is you go offensive line at seven, whether it's a Joe Alt of Notre Dame, Olu Fashionu from Penn State. If a Kool Aid McKinstry or somebody like that is there in the back end of the first round. I would get tempted to trade up if I was Rand Carthon just because they need so much help on the back end. So if you come out of that first round, double dipping in the first round with the offensive lineman and then getting somebody like Kool-Aid McKinstry, I think that would be a home run for them. You mentioned offensive line for a second, and I'm going to stay with the defense in this, and you'll understand my kind of how I'm setting this up. Alt and Fashanu, Alt seems to be the more polished Fashanu, the more athletic upside. Is that kind of the way the same thing is being said and seen in terms of the pass rushers? Jared Verse is kind of the lead guy, yep. but Chop Robinson is maybe the upside guy. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think Jared Verse is probably the most versatile of those top three guys with Dallas Turner and Leatu Latu of UCLA. Verse is, I mean, the best way that I can put it, his hands are stronger than a heavyweight boxer. Like, you see him jolting those offensive tackles back. He's a really good run defender. He came on late down the back stretch of the year, had six and a half sacks during the final five games of the year just because he was facing double teams and there were some schemes um, that offenses were really scheming towards him. So his production was a little bit down during the beginning parts of the year. But he has that versatility that you love to see. And then Chop Robinson, he's just so explosive. Like, He's going to put up some freaky numbers if he does end up doing everything. Like, he's going to run high 4-3, low 4-4. And Penn State has these freaks every year. But Chop, he's, he has a ways to go as a run defender just because they list him at 250 on Penn State's website, but I would be shocked if he's 250 pounds. So he needs to gain some weight in his lower half. But as far as pass rush upside, he's probably the most explosive one in this group. Let's stay on the edge a little bit here, Jordan. Let's go with Darius Robinson from Missouri. Yeah. I think 
kind of caught everybody's eye down there in Mobile. Let's talk about him. Yeah, a very, very versatile player. And I'm on the field in Mobile, and I'm actually standing beside him. And I'm just looking up at him like, man, this dude looks really, really good. One of those first guys you want to get. You want to see him come off the bus first um, if you're the visiting team. But very versatile. He can play anything from a zero all the way out to a five technique. They, they actually reduce him inside in those late down situations just because he has such pass rush upside. And he's ready to go right now, day one as a rookie. I think he can be a starter for you. And we've just seen him blossom throughout the pre-draft process. The senior bowl was just the beginning of where I think his, his, his uh, stock is really going to skyrocket. So middle to back end of the first round, I definitely think that's where he ends up being picked. Another guy that's kind of in that pod for me, just you know, starting it at, at this point, Jonah Ellis from Utah. Yeah, another exciting pass rusher. Um, he kind of had like fourth round grades coming into the year, but the sack production went up. Another one that's just such a polished pass rusher. His numbers were phenomenal last year, so I think second to third round, yeah. I think that's where he ends up going, but another that could be a big tester. Let's go off-ball linebackers, and I think the medicals is going to be a big deal for this yeah. guy, but Peyton Wilson from NC State, I, I want exactly to hear where about you're going. him because <laughs> he, he's certainly in that conversation. And then there's a local young man from Ravenwood High School in, in Nashville, Junior Colson, okay. the three-year starter yep. from one of the million players that Michigan has <laughs> yeah. got here this week. Yeah. But uh, both interesting stories, but Peyton's is – his is the medical to start with, right? Yeah, so I live in Charlotte, and I've went to plenty of NC State games throughout the season, so I've seen Peyton play a ton. And the best way that I put it to everybody, it's like this dude has a GPS tracker on the football when he's out there on the field. His instincts, his ability to step down, key read, and diagnose where the ball is going and run defense is phenomenal. He's really good in pass coverage, and then he adds terrific value as a blitzer as well. He had 17 and a half sack, or excuse me, 17 and a half tackles for loss last year, which led the ACC. So the medical is going to be a big piece for him, but I have a second-round grade on Peyton Wilson. Now, there's still a ways to go with the medicals. He had a couple season-ending injuries with his knee surgery, so medicals are going to be a big piece. But if we're strictly grading the product on the field, I think he's a second-round player all day long. Let's stay in North Carolina, Cedric Gray, that I thought did a nice coverage he job at, at Senior Bowl. I think he's one of the most underrated players, yeah, not just go. linebackers, but in general. And he actually was an athlete when he first got to North Carolina. They didn't know if he was going to play safety or wide receiver, and they ended up playing him at linebacker. But you just see the instincts and the diagnose ability to step down as a run defender. But the pass coverage, that's where he really excels. And he's a little bit undersized at about 6'1", 230. But that's where the game is going with these off-ball linebackers. You have to be able to play um, on passing downs, and I definitely think that's where Cedric Gray is going to excel. Let's go to D Lyman because there's a nice crop of these guys in this, this draft process and a guy that we got a chance to talk to who really made a good impression and certainly made an impression in the ACC championship game is Braden Fisk from, from Florida State. Uh, might not be the biggest or longest prospect, but he's got a motor, right? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> I experienced the ACC title game up close, three and a half tackles for loss, two sacks. He was everywhere. I thought number 55 was the best player on the field that day, and that includes Jerry Verse. Um, he is a little bit of an older prospect, so he's going to be a 25-year-old rookie. But once again, like we talked about with Quinny Mitchell, how do these group of five players adjust when they play that upper level of competition? Him coming from Western Michigan to Florida State, the speed of the game did not affect him at all. And he's continued to check boxes every single step of the process. Now, he's not going to be a huge tester by any stretch of the imagination, but he's one of those just trust what you see on tape players he's being disruptive he's very long he has really good intangibles as well so I think he's one of those players that's probably going to end up going late second early third if I had to guess right now but that second tier of defensive linemen behind Jerzon Newton and also Byron Murphy the second of Texas I think Braden Fisk is in that pot of players and that was the guy I was going to next was Byron Murphy because that's a guy I think may put up some crazy numbers yeah. this week here in Indianapolis, and he is going to be one of the freaks of this group, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're going to see some absolutely freaky numbers with him. And, you know, it's unfortunate that Newton is not participating, just had surgery yeah. in January. So this is a prime opportunity for Murphy to really solidify being that first interior defensive lineman off of the board. So you're going to see some big-time numbers from him. Jordan, the Titans have a one and a two, no three because of the Will Levis trade yep. a year ago. And then they are chock full of picks on day three. Position groups, one or two, maybe three, that you think could produce enough players that there could be really good value on day three with those late picks. 
Well, me personally, I would love to see them double dip at offensive line. You take a Joe Alt or Olu Fashionu at seven, and then you double dip and come back for somebody on day three. I think offensive tackle could be an area of need. Interior, offens offensive line looking to solidify that. Wide receiver could be another area of where they look to add, especially looking for another weapon for Will Levis. Um, tight end could be an area of need for them. And then also cornerback. If, if they don't get one in the first or the second round, I really like the depth of this cornerback group. All right, final question. Every year, every general manager says, oh, I'd love to trade back. Trading back would be fabulous. My first option would be trading back. And so we will throw out on the OTP and other places that we do radio, well, the Titans would like to trade back. All right, so the Titans pick seventh. As we sit here at the NFL scouting combine, two months away from the draft, will they have a shot logistically and logically to get a good enough offer to potentially deal back from seven based on the type of players that could be available to make someone want to go up? Yeah, I think so. I think it all depends on that third quarterback falling, um, whether it's Drake May or Jaden Daniels. But also with J.J. McCarthy, is somebody going to fall in love with him to trade up ahead of uh, Atlanta with them sitting at eight and right now needing quarterback help. We still have free agency to go depending on what they do with that. But if somebody falls in love with that third quarterback, if they fall or J.J. McCarthy to trade up, the Titans could be in a situation ahead of Atlanta to where they could trade back. And maybe get that third round pick. Back. Could recoup it. Good stuff. Jordan Reed, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys as always. For Jordan, for Coach Dave McGinnis and Rhett Bryan, I'm Mike Keith. thanking you for joining us from Indianapolis and the OTP. Where the legends go, everybody knows it's our